Greetings and welcome to Phantom's Edge. This will be chapter 14 of this reading. Captain Akmir Patrons 4 halted a strange-looking seaman apprentice at the docks, where he asked the boy, Your name, apprentice? Tom, sir. Tom? Akmir insulted. Too stupid to speak your words, vermin. The boy glanced down, saddened, then looked up at the captain as he continued, Well, no matter. I know what you can do to get your blood pumping so that thing of a brain you have can focus, vermin. Before moving from the docks, the captain took a quick glance to examine the boy, then quietly said, Guess they're getting desperate these days. He then turned and started walking as he said, Come along, apprentice! The warrant officer took off to continue his patrol, while Akamir led Thomas to a blacksmith stand. There, two saber swords were lined across the counter both with specially designed gold hilts. Akamir tried to reach for one, but the porcupine Nurodenya stopped him and raised one up to the bureau soldier as he said, Here you go, sir. I'll let you know that these are THE finest blades anyone could have. Not even the best sword-crafting blacksmiths could handle making their hilts. Watching all this, Thomas thought, What's going on? Doesn't the bureaucracy have their own blacksmiths? Why is this guy working with a lower form of business? The Mustel captain took the sword that was handed to him and unsheathed it, examining every portion from the tip of the blade to the base of the hilt. Afterwards, he removed the edge from sight and went to tie the weapon in its sheath to his left side. Akmir decided not to keep his old and simple steel saber, along with Commander Emeraz, who he took from, and removed both swords from his side. He handed the inferior weapons to the blacksmith as he said, dispose of these. The Rodinia man took hold of the old swords, then the captain reached into his pocket and pulled out a sack of gold coins. He tossed them onto the stand and said, I'll wait for you to count them if need be, but do so quickly. I'm quite busy. There were, in fact, 223 gold coins, giving a tip to the craftsmanship of the swords the Rodinia had made. Once he took note, Joseph looked up at the soldier and said, for your business, Captain. Have a good day. Yeah, sure. Akmir grasped the second sword, but handed it off to the Rodinia boy as he said, Take this, and do not lose it. Don't even so much as put any of your paw prints on it. Understand, apprentice. Yes, sir. Thomas took hold of the sword's sheath, gripping the part of the cloth that helped tie it to one side, keeping the weapon's handle up with his hands near his chest followed Akamir all the way back to the bureaucracy headquarters and into Commander Emera's assigned room, where the Avifons were sitting around talking. The two stopped as they turned their heads to the front of the room, seeing Akamir closing the doors behind him and the Rodenia boy. The Mustel glanced at the commander and lieutenant commander and asked, Where's Commander Emera? Brandon pointed to the captain's bedroom, then continued his quiet conversation with Perry. However, the captain thought he needed words rather than signs. The Mustel motioned over to the two Avifons and slapped them both upside their heads with his hands simultaneously. Afterwards, he barked, Get up, you lazy fowls! As the two Avifons moved to stand at attention to their superior, the captain continued, Now get out of here and inform the others that we'll be at the meeting in a few minutes. Yes, sir, the subordinates complied. Once the two were gone, Akamir waved his right hand to call Thomas over to him, while Emera walked out of the bedroom in her uniform. She glanced at the seaman apprentice before her, then looked over at her captain and asked, Did you take my blade, Akamir? Yes, and for good reason. The male Mustel pushed the Rodenia forwards as the commander walked over. Then the boy handed off the sword to the female Mustel. He then stepped back, while Akamir continued, this blade will be far better than your previous one. It's the same weight, but nicer shine to the finish, sharper tone to the edge, and will be far stronger in combat. How so? Emera unsheathed the sword, examining it as the captain smiled and replied, It's the poor craftsmanship. Just then, Thomas lightly gasped when he realized the type of blade Commander Emera held in her hands while also remembering the second one strapped to the captain's side. With that, Thomas thought, Oh no, 
they figured out how to make Emperor Phytograss's weapons. That means... We're first gonna hunt down the dual-edged demon, Hakamir said. Then, we're gonna request an order to take on the Lepore Empire for their material to create more of these blades. We might even be able to make rifles out of them. Emera put her weapon away and tied it to her side, then looked over at the captain and said, Thanks, Captain. But how are you gonna get approval for all this? Especially attacking a neutral country for goods that aren't legally ours. Akamir's smile grew as he turned to open the front doors, letting the woman exit first, and responded, Let's take a slow walk and I'll explain it to you, Commander. The Mustels treaded the halls side by side as they led the Rodenia down to the meeting room. They led him only because they were unsure where he should go but just couldn't let him venture off on his own at the present time. So, they took him to the meeting and told him to stand at attention near the front doors, while also demanding he be quiet unless otherwise noted. Commander Emera stood behind her captain as he went to sit amongst his colleagues, while the seaman apprentice stood amongst some of the lieutenant ranks in the back of the room. Thomas glanced around to see who was there, finding Captain Jacqueline and Captain Gregory, both sitting next to each other not too far from his right. Without any of the admirals around to call the meeting, everyone just had simple conversations with each other, which Thomas tried to listen in on just Jacqueline's and Gregory's. Gregory had himself turned to nearly face his colleague, while Jacqueline just aimed forwards but had her eyes focused on reading a small book, acting as if she was uninterested by what the man had to say. So, Jacqueline said, she had her way with you. Bet that was fun. Jacqueline, I didn't intend for that to happen. You know I would never betray you. Oh, I'm not judging you, Gregory. But it seems to me you will have no choice but to be with her. Especially if she gets pregnant from you. That child she made birth will not be of my own since it was not passionate. Yet you also didn't stop her. Please, Jacqueline, just consider my offer before things get out of hand for me. Both captains were silent for a moment, then Jacqueline first looked forward from her seat as she asked, You know what? Before the man could answer, the woman looked over at him with a sarcastic smile and said, No. With that, she looked back down into her book to continue reading. Gregory bent his ears down, disappointed by the response he got, then he turned to sit forward in his seat. He looked down at the table before him and asked, So, that's it? That's it. Thomas smiled as he thought, Good for you, Jackie. It's because you love another, Gregory said. Jacqueline closed her book and tossed it onto the table, then looked over at the other captain as he continued, Isn't it? I saw how James reacted when I tried to enter your room to inform you of what happened earlier. Let me guess. You didn't knock? It's clear to me that you two love each other if he's willing to stand against one of his superiors, regardless of who it may be. Jacqueline glanced over at her commander, confused, then reformed her expression as she looked back at her colleague and said, Yes, Greg. That's why I can't be with you. I've been seeing James for over a month now. Gregory looked back over at the woman and said, But why keep it a secret from me? I would have let you be if I was known to it earlier. I didn't want to be too harsh on you when giving out this information. Jacqueline then looked over to watch the admirals enter the room, while she said, But that was apparently unavoidable. I'm sorry. Gregory nodded his head as he and the rest of the troops went to listen in on what Fleet Admiral Pree had to say. The man was quite tall and, to Thomas' surprise, was a Lepore. His fur was dark forest green, his eyes lime green, and his whiskers bright white. The fleet admiral glanced around at his subordinates, while he said, Fellow members of the bureaucracy army, we have been betrayed. I have received information that both the parties of the Empire of Mongoma and the totalitarianism of Amarek are, in fact, not neutral. They are on the enemy's side, working with the pirates. Every day, more and more ships of ours are attacked, ransacked, and destroyed by mixed groups of each party. 
they follow the pirate ways and want to bring control by making us all stay within our own regions, never seeing what lies beyond our borders. As the fleet admiral continued, Thomas thought, how does he know this? Most of the bureaucracy was banned from entering the empire in the totalitarian areas. There's no way he can get that information, unless he's got spies. Irrationally, Thomas motioned over to kneel in between Captain Jacqueline and Captain Gregory. He first turned to the woman and whispered, Miss Jacqueline, I need to speak with you. Jacqueline glanced back at the Rodeño, finding it just a seaman apprentice, then turned away as she said, Not now, boy. Please, miss, it's really important. Go away now or my commander will drag you away. Thomas glanced around to make sure no one else was watching him or listening in. Then he looked back at the woman and said, Captain Kyle loves you very much, Jackie. Jacqueline quickly looked over at the boy, surprised by his words. Then the child continued, Please leave for the edge. It may be the last time you can see him. Jacqueline started to breathe heavily as she turned away, staring down at the table, while Gregory looked over to notice her reaction. He then looked over at the boy and asked, what is your problem, boy? You can't just wait till later. Thomas looked over at the man and said, Please, sir, you must leave too. Someone wishes to speak with you. Gregory turned to keep himself nonchalant to the rest around him, while he asked, What's so important that I have to leave this meeting? Love. The Kanai glanced over, confused. Then Thomas continued, Just patrol the bars, Captain, and you will find her. The Black Cat. What? With his job about done, Thomas went to head out the double doors, where he stopped to notice someone he knew walk in. There before the Rodenia was Daisy. She too was shocked to see the boy standing in front of her. It became angry as she said, So they finally sent you, doing so without me knowing. The room went silent as everyone looked over to find the Persioni and the Rodenia staring at each other. Then Fleet Admiral Pree said, Ah, Catherine, you're here. The fleet admiral waved his hand to call the woman over, while the Persioni devilishly smiled as she gently patted her left hand on Thomas's head and quietly said, Stick around, apprentice. You'll need to hear this, seeing as it will be the last time you ever hear, see, or do anything. Thomas turned to watch as the Persioni motioned over to the fleet admiral, the boy still in shock. Pri reached his left arm around the Persioni to hold her left shoulder and said, Everyone, this is Catherine, my personal and specially assigned spy. She's been doing great work in telling me what will become of the pirates, especially about our vile friend, the dual-edged demon. Thomas, still facing the doors, thought, Personal? She was hired by the fleet admiral himself? She'd been informing me for over four months, telling me that the pirates plan to invade our headquarters, while also she gave tips on where our most notorious pirate, Captain Kayo, would be. Therefore, we can now avoid him until we have confirmed there are no others under his might. Prey leaned over slightly to listen to what Catherine had to say, then he removed his arm from her and said, Ladies and gentlemen, it seems to me that the time for invasion has come. At that point, Everyone began to whisper about, confused and a bit surprised that there could be a pirate spy among them. However, before he was exposed, Thomas jolted out of the room and ran to head back to Captain Kyle. With that, Captain Akmere gave no hesitation as he revealed his blade and yelled, AFTER THE PIRATE! Thomas not only ran from the bureaucracy headquarters, but removed himself of his fake uniform and placed his pistol in front of his stomach under his belt. He ran through back alleys, jumped fences, and squeezed through large crowds to break away from the bureau. However, no matter what he did, he couldn't shake the soldiers. Yet with all the commotion, Captain Jacqueline and Captain Gregory, along with their best subordinates, broke away from the group and set out to find those waiting for them. Reaching the end of the city to the docks, Thomas had lost all but Captain Akamir, Commander Emera, and her Avifon subordinates along with Captain Diana and her two Persioni subordinates. 
The boy was beginning to run out of breath and was slowing down, yet he wasn't going to give up. As Thomas neared the Ecuador, he shouted, Captain! Kyo heard the call, then quickly barked to the other crew members, Ready your stations, lads, and remember your orders. Thomas gave out a second call to Kayo, which the Kanai pirate looked over the stern of the Ecuador to see the Rodenia having a large group of bureaucracy soldiers chasing him. Seeing them near, the pirate pulled out his saber and threw it like a dart towards Thomas. Of course, he did not intend to have it strike the boy. Thomas was forced to stop as he noticed warrant officers with several seamen blocking his path. Then he turned to face those that were following him. Just as they neared, Akamir pulled out his pistol and aimed to fire at the boy. However, the moment the shot was given, a saber sword came down and struck the bullet, saving the Rodinia from death. The Bureau soldiers were surprised to see the blade, while also to see who came after it. Kayo jumped down, alongside Brunhilde, both holding their cutlasses and reading against the yellow jacketed brigade. The black cat stood against the warrant officers and seamen, while the dual edged demon pulled out his saber from the docks as he faced the captains and their subordinates. Oddly enough, the Ecuador began sailing off from the shore, leaving the three pirates behind. Give up, demon! Diana yelled. This ends now! Kyle smiled as he looked at the Avifawn and calmly said, Yes, it does. And no, I won't. Akamir and Diana both jolted for the pirate before them at the same time, trying to strike at him simultaneously. Yet even so, the dual-edged demon was too fast and skilled to be touched by the bureau captains. Along with that, the black cat took on the warrant officers and seamen, using only one sword in her hand. Not long after the fight started, Kayo and Brunhilde jolted to switch targets, still keeping the fight ongoing against the bureau. After a moment, Kayo finally moved to jump away from the entire battle. Everyone stopped to notice him, while the pirate called out, So long, chaps! He put both swords away, then waved for a second as he yelled, I'm off to let you play with the new generation. As the dual-edged demon escaped the grasp of the BRC yet again, everyone glanced around to try and understand what he meant. However, the black cat continued to fight against Captain Akamir and Captain Diana. Felina quickly sliced the Avifon's neck, killing her easily, then Emera joined it. However, she wasn't much as Brunhilde kicked the female Mustel out of the scene for a second, then went to take the male Mustel one on one. Brunhilde clashed swords a couple times with Akamir, then was able to shatter his special saber's blade with her own simple steel cutlass with one hard swing. Quickly moving from her downward slice, the Felina grabbed her hilt with both hands and went to thrust upward, stabbing through the Mustel's torso. In Akamir's last seconds, Brunhilde looked him straight in his eyes and said, Consider this payback for my brother, Akamir. She then ripped out the blade and stepped back, letting the Bjarkzi soldier fall to the floor. Shocked to see her love wounded in her presence, Emera stood nearly paralyzed at the dead Mustel's sight. She started to cry as her hand loosened her weapon, dropping the sword as she ran over to hold Akamir's body and shouted, Brother! She held him close, forgetting about the fight, while she said, Please, brother, no. Don't go. You were the only one. The only one for me. Don't go. Please. Brunhilde sheathed her own sword, then smiled as she glanced back at Thomas and said, Take care, double-bladed devil. The black cat took off, bypassing the bureau soldiers and vanishing into the city. Emera cried harder as she held her brother's lifeless body in her arms, then screamed to the sky for her loss. She tried to calm down, while Thomas readied his blades in his hands to stand alone against the bureaucracy military that surrounded him. Looking down at the Mustel with an uncaring gaze, the Rodania child said, That's what you get for making inferior Lepore weapons, weasel. Emera lowered her brother and stood up, still looking down at him, while she said, Inferior? You're the one who's inferior, vermin! She then averted her eyes to the boy with such hatred flaring from her gaze. She readied her pistol for a shot at the pirate, aiming at the boy's head as she said, I'll blow you away! Amazingly, a blade stopped Emera's sentence, 
yet it wasn't a weapon of Thomas's. It was instead the saber Emra had dropped, the one with the true craftsmanship of the Lepore. Perry had the blade stabbed through Emra's back and out her chest where her heart was, the edge aimed out to his right side. Ending the life of his former commander, Perry quickly removed the sword from her body, where she fell into the water beneath the docks. Davifon then moved to stand at the Rodania's right side, readying against his own soldiers. Perry glanced over at the child and said, Don't worry, I'm not here to hurt you. He then looked back at the Bureau soldiers and said, I'm just fed up with the bureaucracy and can't stand to be within its mitts anymore. Very well then, Thomas said, but I must ask of you to stand down. I want to show these fools who they're dealing with. Captain's orders. As you wish, devil. Brayden, along with those around him, ready to stand off against the pirate as he yelled, How dare you betray us, Perry? After all we've given you? After all the help the bureaucracy's done within your life? Perry smiled as he continued to hold his blade against the soldiers, while he said, Sorry, but I've had it with the bureaucracy. So word of advice, you better find a true way for peace before either the Empire or the Totalitarians decide to sweep you all off the map. Perry tried to figure out a way past the soldiers to let Thomas deal with them on his own, then found he could slip by underwater. It was at least nine feet deep, giving him enough room to both submerge and swim off to climb back up far apart from the group. Davy Fon slid his left foot out just an inch, getting ready for his leap into the water below, while all the Bureau soldiers went to aim their pistols at the Rodenia boy. Just as Perry jumped off into the water, the soldiers fired upon the boy's corner, but soon after were found outmatched. Thomas spun to swing his blades wildly, deflecting and breaking each bullet that neared. He stopped his motion to be facing Lieutenant Commander Braden again, standing completely unharmed. Braden, along with his colleagues, were shocked as they dropped their pistols before them. Then the lieutenant commander said, Im Impossible. Is he the dual-edged demon's son? The double-bladed devil gave a vile grin at the soldier before him, knowing the bureaucracy had no idea who they were really dealing with. Yet even so, one bold soldier went to attack the boy with his pathetic sword. Shortly followed were the soldier's colleagues, who Thomas went to fend off using his undestructible weaponry and unmatched agility. This concludes the reading of chapter 14. Thank you all for watching and listening. If you like what you've seen and heard, be sure to check out my other two novels, Lore of the Endowment and Ryu the Demon Slayer. Link will be in the description below. Other than that, Stay safe, take care, and we'll see you again next week, reading chapter 15.